So, chapter 3 of the Confession of God's Decree. Um, we, we already learned from the first paragraph that God decreed everything that occurs. Okay? No restrictions, no qualifications. He has decreed everything that occurs. And we've learned, and you'll see it in that first sentence, that he decreed everything that occurs without reference to anything outside of himself. He didn't consult anything or anyone. He has decreed everything by the perfectly wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely, uncoerced, and unchangeably, immutable. Okay, get, get that word into your vocabulary. God is immutable. He cannot be changed. He cannot be stopped. He cannot be thwarted. Um, and because his decrees flow out from within himself, his decree, his planning, everything that will happen in all, all of creation, it's, that is also immutable. You can't change it. You can't thwart it. It is written in stone, okay? Um, and we know that there is this concurrence that we can witness where we know that God has decreed everything which comes to pass. He is absolutely sovereign, but that does not go against the will of creatures. So God can decree things which includes maybe even um, falling to sin, but at the same time, it is the creature still out of their own will and volition that commits it. And yes, in that sense, it is a, a mystery. But our confession has plainly um, taught to us that instead of violating the will of the creatures or taking away the free working or contingency of secondary causes, on the contrary, God's decree establishes secondary causes. Okay? So, God had part of his decree was that um, Adam would fall. But God is not connected to sin. He does not create sin, cause sin, coerce sin. He is not the author of sin. He establishes secondary causes such as Satan. Satan tempted Adam. We never see in the Bible God caused Adam to sin. Or God tempted Adam to sin. We never see that because God's sovereign decree does establish secondary causes. Creatures still work and act freely. They are not robots. And we know from paragraph two that God's decree is not based on him just foreseeing. I wonder what would happen if I did this and then that became his plan. No, he knows the future because he has decreed the future. Okay. Uh, in paragraph three then, we were introduced to this last week. We know this is one of the highlights of God's decree, even in Scripture, that by God's decree, paragraph 3, and for the demonstration of His glory, some human beings and angels are predestined or foreordained to eternal life through Jesus Christ to the praise of His glorious grace. Others are left to live in their sin, leading to their just condemnation to the praise of His glorious grace justice. So that's, that's where we were at last week. God's decree of election and reprobation. Okay? And we know that even this decree, just as all of his decrees, is immutable. Look at paragraph 4. These predestined and foreordained angels and people are individually and unchangeably designated. And the number is so certain and definite that it cannot be either increased or decreased. God's not adding new elect people to the Lamb's Book of Life. <laughs> All right? God is also not removing people from the already written Lamb's Book of Life. And, and there is language, and we can tackle that later if you'd like, uh, about the concept of blotting you out and whatnot, okay? Remember the way that the Bible uses human language and concepts and illustrations for, for, to help us understand things, right? We're, we're not to believe that before creation, there was a book of the Lamb who was slain, and all of the names of God's elect was written there, but if you go against God's decree and you reject 
His grace, then you will be removed from the book that was already written. No, it's, it's not that. It's, it's explaining to us the reality that those who reject the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ are, are not counted among those who belong to the Lord, right? This is true for, I mean, immutability, unchangeableness is true for both election and reprobation. And then we focus on election. So if you look at your um, um, outline, when we get to paragraph three, God's particular decree of election and reprobation, what have we learned about election? Election is a decree to give undeserved grace. We often call it a positive decree. It is a decree to give something to the creature which the creature did not deserve in the first place. Okay? Life. And election, secondly, is unto eternal life. Thirdly, election is through Christ. We were chosen in Christ. We were predestined in Christ. So God's choice of electing some was not just, I want some to live. No, it was all in light of the fact that God is choosing a people to be the bride of His Son whom He would send, Christ, that they would be united to Him and one with God. And fourthly, election is unto the praise of God's grace. We looked at plenty of scripture when considering election. And then this is where we left off. And I want to say a few more things about the, the other side of this coin, if you will, reprobation. Because if God has elected some unto salvation, and this is his decree, uh, it, it only makes sense that there are some that are not elect. They are reprobate. They were passed over. And we had some good conversations about this concept of double predestination and how many outright reject the concept of double predestination right away because they mistake it for uh, a teaching that is not, if you go to membership classes, corner room over there. They, <laughs> they mistake it for a teaching that we call equal ultimacy, okay? And that's the teaching that both election and reprobation are positive, positive, positive. So election would be giving life to the creature, so something is added. And then in this view, the, the view we don't agree with, reprobation is also adding something to the creature, such as adding sin or giving unbelief or creating unbelief in the heart of the person so that they would die in their sins. And we disagree with that. When we say double predestination, we are simply saying that God has already predestined the fact that some are elect and He has chosen to pass over the rest. He has chosen not to bequeath his amazing, undeserved grace to the others, okay? So it is never an issue, it should never be an issue of why does God choose some and not others? As we say, the real issue is that because it's undeserved life and grace, eternal life with God, the real question should always, that boggles our mind should always be, why does God give grace to any at all? Why does God choose to give life to those people who, even though it's under his decree, by their own volition, have sinned against their maker. So as we look at the nature of reprobation, we know that reprobation is a decree to withhold undeserved grace. And even that language can be sticky, because when we say withhold, we can mistakenly think that it was supposed to be given, that it was, God was indebted to give grace to the people. Uh, no, that's not what we're saying. It's simply a decree to pass over them in that sense. They didn't deserve the grace in the first place. He was not indebted to give them the grace in the first place. He is not doing an injustice towards them. Uh, yes, Ian. Um, I've heard some say that um, God is indebted to um, owe grace to people because well, to humans, because they're made in the image of God. So yeah. how can we respond to that argument? That it's not in the Bible, I guess, is how we oh, respond well. to it. Well, because, I, because like, um, it, just simply because I, the, in the image of God, they, God has to give them grace. I, I, see, I yeah. see the logic, but it's, it goes against the logic of Scripture, because that seems to be a misdefinition of grace. Grace is 
unmerited favor. And when you use the language that you've just used, even though it sounds innocent, it almost sounds like by virtue of being in the image and likeness of God, you automatically have the merits to make God indebted to you, to give you grace. That's confusing creation and redemption. That's confusing nature and grace. God made us in his image and likeness and therefore he shows benevolence and love. He gives us food, he gives us clothing, he gives us all of these wonderful things. Do not then take that and go super beyond that and say, and also he deserves to, I mean, he owes me that he must save me when I sin. No, or else grace would not be grace. If something, and this is one of the things that a confession actually says, that there's nothing in the creature, right? Um, in paragraph five, it says, he chose them in Christ for eternal glory purely as a result of his free grace and love. Look at this. Without anything else about them serving as a condition or cause, moving him to do so. Okay? So there's nothing inherent in the creature that would cause God to give grace. The reason why God gives grace is out of his own goodness. Okay, so it's a misdefinition of grace, I think, and confusion of creature, uh, creature um, creation and redemption. Okay, um, so reprobation is a decree to withhold undeserved grace. Secondly, reprobation is God's decree to leave the non-elect to themselves. That's why we call it a, a passive decree or a passing over. And reprobation is just. There is no injustice being done to the creature. This is their just condemnation because of their own sins. And lastly, reprobation is unto the praise of God's justice. So when we think about eternity after this creation, um, we have both realities of the new creation where there is no wickedness and evil or sin or death no more for all the wicked are thrown into the outer darkness. And what do we see in Ephesians? We see that for eternity, we will be to the praise of God's glorious grace. We will be an eternal testimony that God is, is a freely gracious, merciful, and loving God who has chosen to save undeserving sinners. And our testimonies will bear witness to that goodness of God for all eternity. Right? And then, on the other hand, how about those who are in eternal torment? How does that glorify God? Well, that also is a witness and testimony to the glorious justice of our God. That He is a God that does not sweep sin under the rug. That He is a God, because He is a good judge, that truly punishes the iniquities of sinners. And so as horrible, and it is horrible, as eternal um, torment seems in terms of being under the wrath of God, let's still remember that that is unto the praise of God's justice. So the attributes of God are put on display eternally. His grace on display for all eternity through the testimony of sinners saved. His justice put on display for all eternity in the just condemnation of sinners. Okay, now, a couple of things I want to say about reprobation uh, that we weren't able to cover last time, okay? If you read the Puritans, they would, distinguishes, they would distinguish between positive and negative reprobation, okay? Positive and negative. There are two aspects within the concept of reproba reprobation, Okay? Um, one is called preterition. The, the term's not that important, but let's use it first. One is called preterition, and the other is called predamnation. Okay? That's a much, powerful con much more powerful concept. So far, when we've talked about reprobation, we have not been talking about the concept of predamning. Okay? Does that fit? within our concept of reprobation. Well, let's begin with the first aspect, preterition. So preterition is really mostly what we've been talking about. It is the mere decree not to grant grace, not to grant life, not to grant salvation, and it does no injustice to the creature because the creature was not deserving of it in the first place and God was not indebted to the creature. But 
we must confess that there is also another aspect of reprobation which you might call pre-damnation. And that is, inevitably, because God decrees all things, what's going to happen to the non-elect when Jesus returns to judge the living and the dead? They will be damned, correct? So we can't just remove that reality from God's decree. If God has decreed all things whatsoever which comes to pass, that, necess that by necessity includes that there are a people who will be damned. Uh, in fact, um, we hear about that in, in the context of false teachers that infiltrated the church, and I think we read this passage um, in Jude. And I won't say Jude chapter 1, because you made fun of me. Um, but on certain Bible apps, it is called Jude chapter 1. I don't know. So um, in Jude, we are told in uh, verse 4, For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God. So there are, there are people designated, preordained unto damnation. But we need to be careful here. We can all agree on preterition that, that God has decreed not to grant a certain people he passes over with any salvation blessings. But when we speak of predamnation, um, by and large, if you read the Puritans, there is common agreement, at least on this, that there is no concept of damnation without the concept of sin and rebellion and the fall. So we can speak of God's decree of not giving grace to the non-elect as having no reference whatsoever to, to sin or righteousness or faith or unbelief or anything like that. It is his, his decree of who would and who would not have life. But when it comes to the concept of predamnation, we need to understand that that is God's decree taking into account the fall. Okay? Taking into account every single one of the non-elect's sins and, and their being under, under the federal headship of Adam. Or else the word damnation doesn't even really make sense because what are you damned for but, but for your sins? Okay, I, I just thought that was really important because although there's no chronological order in God's decrees, there is still logical order in God's decrees. We were happy to say that, that God decreed some to have life and passed over the rest, that, they, that He would not grant them life. And, and this has no necessary reference um, to the fall and to Adam and to, to all of these things. But when it comes to language like... Um, Okay, even with election, the, the decree to give life, okay? But when we use words like salvation from their sins, redemption from their sins, now obviously we are taking into account that they sinned, that there are sins. So in the same way with reprobation, when we talk about damnation, um, or even when it comes to the book of Romans, that there were some who were made vessels of wrath, do not think of that as independent of their actual sinfulness. Or else you make God out to be one who damns apart from the reality of sin. And, and that is not our God. A God does not damn a people apart from the reality of the sinfulness of those people. So I thought that whole preterition and predamnation would be helpful. Yes. Um, uh, how do we respond, uh, tying in with that, when people uh, object and say that you are uh, sent to hell and down for not accepting Christ instead of for your sins? Yeah, I, that is not a good way to speak, actually. Now, it is a technically correct statement that um, those who go to heaven are those who receive Jesus Christ. Those who go to hell, well, those are also people who have not received Jesus Christ. Those are people who have rejected Jesus Christ. Right, But the passages in the scriptures about judgment, when the final judgment actually comes, okay, when it comes to the righteous, the books are going to be opened, and what do you know? Their track record of sinfulness is gone. And instead, in their credit, will be the righteous life of Jesus Christ. And by His merits, 
you're in. You are mine because of the blood of Jesus. Okay? And then how about for those who remain in their sins? It's not going to be, did you accept? Did you accept? Did you accept? Did you accept? It's not actually that. It's that the books will be opened and your sins will be accounted before you and it will be found that your sins are still there to damn you. And you have no savior. Yes, you have rejected Christ. You have not believed upon Christ. But what does that mean? It means that your sins are still counted against you. That's the real reason. And it's not just actual sins that are the reason why we're damned, by the way. Remember, we are conceived in iniquity by virtue of being under the federal headship of Adam. Even as we're conceived, we're already sinners. We're already condemned. We are already inheriting the, the guilt and condemnation and original sin of Adam. And the book shall be opened and you will be counted a, a sinner. So it's not actually that helpful to use the language. Um, what was it? What was the language? People go to hell because they rejected Jesus. Well, that's correct in the sense that is it a sin to reject Jesus? Yes. So to be, to be much broader of a realistic statement, people go to hell because of their sins, because they die in their sins, because they love their sin more than God, because they choose their sin instead of the Savior. Um, so it can be technically true, but sometimes it can skew people's mindsets into thinking that God is saving and rejecting people independent of the realities of their sinfulness. Yeah. Lincoln first. Um, I was just going to say, you did mention through the fall, so you taking a supra lapsarian view there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> all right, cool. <laughs> That's just me. That doesn't have to be everybody. That's not part of our membership covenant or anything like that, okay? Uh, Caitlin was here. Oh, okay. It's a nice one. So I just wanted to ask, nice so haircut. would we say then our confession of faith would not agree with a broad, like double predestination would be that. God condemns people. Would we say that it, we don't agree with that then? So we don't agree with equal ultimacy. We agree with double predestination, but there's a stream of pre double predestination called equal ultimacy, um, which, did you just walk in? Which is the, <laughs> which is the, the belief um, that God positively elects some and therefore gives them life but God also positively reprobates some and, and therefore, let's say, creates unbelief in them, causes them um, to, to be condemned in that way. We would, agree, we would disagree with that and say no. Their, the decree of their condemnation, their pre-damnation, um, has to take in account the reality that they're condemned for their sins and never independently of that. Now, when we speak of the decree in terms of withholding life and grace and undeserved favor, oh yeah, we don't, ha we don't have to take account the realities of their sin because God is not indebted to give them grace in the first place. But when we say damned, under God's wrath, we must take into account the decree of the fall and the people's sin. Yep. So, Follow up? Yeah, sorry. So is there a chance that there is someone who can look for God's grace and favor uh, fervently, but never find it. If they are not elect, yes. But then the question must be asked, what do we mean that they look for God's grace and favor fervently? Because we believe that somebody can be sincere, passionate, fervent in their pursuit of the divine, and there are many like that, Pious in many ways, trying to live moral lives and truly find God. But apart from the work of regeneration, which is granted only to the elect, it is not a true seeking after God. Yep. And which means I still love their sin more than God. Correct. Yeah. Um, and adding to that tonight as well, I kind of thought that's what double predestination was, mm. so equal ultimacy. So I was a bit like, I don't love the sound of yeah. that So until Josh explained that last week. Um, the other week. My, yeah, my add-on to what you just said was really helpful around the whole G Jesus 
people don't go to hell because they rejected Jesus. Yeah, not merely not... because. Yeah, because I guess then that leaves you to the whole um, argument of what happens to the person who never got to reject Jesus. To hear about Jesus. heard of him. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I was just kind of adding, going to add on to that. That's help, a helpful way of understanding it more clearly because yeah. then we can say, well, the Such person a good point. who never heard of Jesus also still sin. So Correct. Yeah. Such a good point because some people will ask that. Like, are you telling me that just because this guy from this mountain in this tribe who's never experienced Western religion and stuff like that and no missionaries ever came, just because he never heard the gospel, even though he tried to be a good person, you're telling me he is going to hell? No, no, no. That's not the actual reason why he's going to hell. That's, that's, that's a part of the bigger actual reason, which is that he's going to hell because he sinned against the Holy God. That, that's the reason why. He sinned against the Holy God. And so, you know, that conundrum has led some people to, you know, fall into the false belief that people who have never heard the gospel because they never got to hear it, well, at the very least, God gives them a chance. And if they really, this is actually official, officially canonized in Roman Catholic doctrine as of now, that if they truly follow the Christ of their conscience, who they've never heard, but is within them, and they follow the dictates of their conscience to the best of their ability to pursue and find God, they can be saved. And we're like, no, that's, no, that's not how it works. How, how, how will they believe upon him? Of, how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear if there is not a preacher? And how will anyone preach to them if no one is sent? Therefore, what does um, Paul quote Isaiah? How beautiful, therefore, are the feet of those who bring good news. Is that like uh, Plato and Aristotle who looked sure. and found the one true God? Sure. So they, they, they got saved, yeah? No. <laughs> yes. So you've got pre damnation and pre. Preterition, preterition. Preterition. Um, are they always necessarily together or could you like, I guess. Yeah, because God's decree is really one. Um, you, you, you can, we only separate them. Yeah. It's kind of like the attributes of God. Yeah. God is simple. His decree is one, yeah. complete, but like, unified. But we have to make these distinctions or else we, we just, we can't even talk about it. We yeah. can't understand. Predorition, like, predamnation. If, like Adam had fulfilled the, the covenant of works yes. eternally. He would not be predamned, but he also like, would be like, he wouldn't have grace, right? So if he, it, hypo, totally, hypothetical, hypo, totally hypothetical, totally hypothetical. What about Christ? If Adam, if Adam fulfilled the covenant of works, yeah. he would have achieved life for his yes. posterity. He would have extended the borders of the Garden of Eden to fill the whole earth. Yes. All of his children would have been godly seed and he would have filled the earth with the glory of God, which is much like what we're talking about when it comes to the new creation, hypothetically. Yeah. But Yeah, so isn't that an example of like not being pre-damned, but you are pre, I forget the word, uh, perturbed. Uh, sorry, no. You know, you know what? Because of our language of covenant of works of covenant of grace, yeah. we sometimes fail to understand that even, of the co even the covenant of works was gracious in a sense. In that, let's say hypothetically Adam did do that, it's because God continued to stain, sustain him in, in righteousness by his powerful grace. If Adam continued his life of righteousness, and he fulfilled the covenant of works in perpetual obedience, it would still be by virtue of God's sustaining grace because he created him upright and righteous in the first place. Um, and we do believe that God has the right to withhold his sustaining grace. And um, Adam fell um, because of lack of dependence, if you will, upon the sustaining grace of God. And God has every right to, to withhold that, at so least in that moment in time. That applies to uh, Christ as well. Um like fulfilling the, the covenant of works? Yeah, so he, he fulfills the, the like covenants in three levels. He fulfills a covenant of redemption, the mission that was given to him by the Father. Um, in a sense, he fulfills the terms of the covenant of works, but the covenant of works has already been broken. You can't redo it, but he fulfills the terms of it because he obeys where Adam disobeyed. Well, the serpent defeated him, crushed him, loved the Lord, all of that. Um, but don't forget, he also is a Jew. And he also fulfilled all righteousness according to Mosaic law. Um, 
So I just wanted to say that, but what was your question? <laughs> I was just just checking if that you actually can't separate those two. You can't separate those yeah. two, yeah. Very cool. good. Very good. To help us out here, could you uh, please very quickly interact with how the tree of the knowledge of good and evil would be a necessary sacrament, regardless of the outcome, and yeah. um, how Christ didn't have a tree of the knowledge of good and evil right. for him? I don't know about what you mean by the necessary, but yeah, I guess it is helpful to think about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil as, uh, let's say, almost like a, the sacrament of the covenant of works. It was a visible sign of invisible realities, spiritual realities. Um, the reward being able to um, eat of the tree of life would have been a confirmation of Adam's success and victory and righteousness. That's why we who are in Christ the conqueror, according to the book of Revelation, I grant them who conquers to eat of the tree of life. It's a sign, sealing and signifying the victory and righteousness and life. At the same time, there's the tree of life did I say that? Tree of life, right? I've been talking about the tree of life? Or did I mix it up? I've been talking about the tree of life. Then there's another tree. There's two trees. There's two signs. There's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which really represented death. Um, and so it's, it's as if Adam chose to partake in death instead of life. Whereas when it comes to Christ, he actually needs to fulfill all righteousness because when it comes to the Messiah, he, he is not there to eat of the tree of life per se, like Adam, he himself is to be our tree of life. And that's why he fulfills all righteousness, and then we therefore partake of Christ and have life. Is that sort of what you were getting at? Would Adam have known good and evil, regardless of whether he ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Would he have known good and evil? No. Yeah. So not Jehardus Voss. Uh, I'm not sure what he says about it. What, what did he say? How does he get to know it? Jehardus Voss, building on um, the uh, two trees as a sacrament, yes. um, he says that Adam would have known uh, good and evil regardless of whether he uh, ate of the tree of knowledge of oh, good and evil. Oh, you're talking about just having an understanding of what is good and what is evil, not experientially knowing evil. Uh, well, yeah, th that's right. That's right. Uh, but well, by uh, it's 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 a negative. By yeah, yeah. Okay. That, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, Jehovah's is fine. Um, yeah. So by fulfilling righteousness, perpetual obedience, uh, and of course being able to eat of the tree of life and so on, um, knowing the goodness of God, knowing the nature of God, knowing righteousness and whatnot. Of course, Adam will be able to know what is the opposite of that. What is the absence of goodness? What is the absence of grace? And he can actually know what evil is. Yes. What I'm essentially getting at is that the previous question is actually a confusion of categories um, because um, uh, the pre-damnation and, and uh, pre-territion uh, cannot exist uh, separately there because the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which Adam eats of, yes. uh, exists as he would know both either way. Right, which means, right, right. Which means that it's not that him failing it uh, would mean that he is, uh, he, he is pre-tired, but he is not pre-damned. It is that he would know in them both ways, and therefore the mechanic is that he would still be uh, both pre-tied and pre-damned if, uh, if he failed, and as he passes, it, uh, neither, uh, it would retroactively be uh, found out that neither is true of him. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah, so essentially the, the previous question yeah, would, is a uh, conflation of his, Historia Salutis and um, uh, Ordo Salutis okay. as the mechanics of the, the covenant of works. Right. Is, is essentially well, you think about that, Dominic. All right. Um, yeah, Are we, there, were, there was some, um, I guess in talking about this, we were making some assumptions about the belief of whether or not Adam was uh, elect, right? Um, makes things interesting. Many would, of course, say that the clothes that covered them um, when God gave them animal skins as a type and shadow of the, being clothed in the righteousness of Christ would then assume um, that they were actually saved by grace. Um, this is for chapter seven, chapter eight, but it is interesting to think about Adam in that sense, saved by grace, yet he remains in the scriptures um, the federal head of those who remain or are damned. Interesting stuff. Uh, we'll get there on the covenants. Thank you. So um, paragraph four, as we've already seen, says that election is definite. We agree. We've been talking about it. Paragraph five tells us election is free. So as we've said, the choice that he made in that second sentence, in Christ for eternal glory, 
was purely a result of his free grace and love. There was nothing in the creature serving as a condition or cause that moved God to elect them. So our confession is decidedly against the Arminian teaching that God elects people based on foreseeing if they would have faith. Foreseeing, would this guy have faith? Would this girl have faith? If I put together these circumstances, will they come to faith? And then on that basis, God elects them. I've heard that explained by lots of teachers. Our confession goes clearly against that. Election is free because um, if you look at our outline, we are now in um, main point number five. Election is free. And I'm going to give you five reasons. Election is free because it is eternal and immutable. Um, again, Ephesians chapter 1, um, verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Um, verse 9 and verse 11 is helpful as well. Um, we didn't exist in eternity past, so God's election is not based upon us or anything in us. It is by grace alone, right? If election is unto life, if these are matters of salvation, well, we've got to maintain that it is by grace alone. This seems almost like just being too tedious and technical about it, but seriously, if you confess the five solas, and if you believe that salvation is by grace alone, to propose a doctrine of election that is based upon something foreseen in the creature or in the sinner, we would argue, destroys the grace aloneness of grace alone. Because now it has some reference to something in the creature and not purely the grace of God. And that's a problem. Election is free because it is immutable. Um, we see letter B. Election is free because it is according not to our will, but God's will, a.k.a. the secret counsel and good pleasure of His will. We are entirely indebted to God. He's not indebted to us. God alone elected us, even though we were not deserving of it. Let us see. Election is free because we were chosen in Christ. Chosen in Christ unto everlasting glory. That's what we see. Um, again, looking at Ephesians chapter 1, we read verse 4, and then it says, In love He predestined us. Verse 4 says, Chosen in Him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world. Clearly, this is God's immutable will, that He would choose a people to be the bride of His Son, and that one day He would send that Son to lay down His life for her. Let us see. Election is free because we were, oh, sorry. D, election is free because it is out of free, God's free grace and love. That's what it says. Out of his free grace and love. Um, 2 Timothy 1.9, listen to this. God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Letter E, last one. Election is free because it is undeserved. We read without any other thing in the creature as a condition or cause of moving him. Or without anything else about them, the people, serving as a condition or cause moving him to do so. Um, I think all this is, is taking seriously some of our favorite passages like Ephesians 2, 8 onwards. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, the whole package, the whole thing, not a result of work so that no one may boast. Sanctification, which is salvation, which is a gift of grace, even that we are told, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. So, so the entire thing is by grace. Even election, which is a gracious doing of God, is something that happens to us in Christ. We are elected in Christ. You know how we said last time that at the heart of the Christian message is 
union with Christ, and all the blessings of salvation flow to us in and through the person and work of Jesus Christ. We know he became incarnate in time and space, but he is, our, he is the chosen mediator between God and man from eternity. The, the, that agreement was set in stone from eternity. So get this, even that very beginning point of choosing us to be saved is ours in a sense only in Christ. God chose us in Christ. So this is a very Christological, very Christ-centered understanding of salvation, and that's gonna, um, you're, see, you're gonna see all of this stuff bleed into chapter eight, Christ, our mediator. Any questions before we end? Yeah. In uh, here, paragraph five, um, which is quoting Ephesians one, mm -hmm. um, uh, so in either or, um, uh, what is this secret counsel? Is it merely the uh, secret uh, uh, will of God, or is this actually a reference to the covenant of redemption? Mm. So um, I, I think at least by implication, we see this as a reference to the covenant of redemption um, because Sometimes we mistake election to be purely the work of the Father, but we believe that the operations of the Trinity are inseparable. We believe that God is a perfect union of three. So we, I would agree that the secret counsel of God uh, would include the perfect unity and agreement and plan of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the work of redemption. Yeah. So... The son was in perfect agree agreement, of course, because God has one mind, one will. Son was in perfect agreement with um, the father sending him. Spirit was in perfect agreement to be the one drawing the saints, indwelling the church, and so on. So, yeah, including election. Perfect agreement. Final questions? Yeah. What was that? Yep. Yeah. Let's pull it up. But go ask the question so everyone hears you. At the start, you mentioned that um, where he wouldn't blot people's names out. Can you explain on that, please? Yep. So, um, where's my Bible? Oh. Some passages, a few passages use this language. Um, it, let's, let's begin with the Old Testament. So, Psalm 69. Um, Psalm 69, verse 28. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. Okay, so that's an interesting um, statement. Um, and I'm sure you could think of other places where uh, that is used. Um, Exodus 32, 33 uses similar language. Um, and then you get to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Um, and this is what we read in Revelation 3, verse 5. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. So when you actually see the places where it is stated explicitly in terms of blotting out the name of the book of life, I, I haven't done tremendous preparation in terms of this phrase for today, but at least the one that I'm familiar with, if you look at it closely, it's actually talking about never blotting his name out of the book of life. Um, but some do take that and say, by implication, your name can be blotted out of the book of life. I don't know. You've got phones and stuff like that. Can you think of anything explicitly that speaks of, if you do this, I will blot you out of my book of life? Can, can you actually, I don't know. I, I might be wrong. I, I don't memorize every verse of the Bible. Um, does anybody know anything that even hints at that? Yeah, saved by far, but still saved but still saved, with, um, with fire on your, on your coattails, um, but still saved, yep. Uh, there is a, um, a passage in Deuteronomy which, uh, where God says um, that you will be forgotten mm. uh, from out of the world. Um, yet also Deuteronomy speaks about um, so the kings. You're going to answer yourself, right? No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, but but it because uh, because it's part of the context. The Deuteronomy itself also speaks about kings who are um, uh, who say who it says it will be forgotten, but the book itself remembers them. Right, right. Yeah. So, so, but there is, yeah, so it's obviously the speaking not necessarily forgotten. of, yeah, it's, it's not a reference to the Lamb's Book of Life, first of all. Um, and I think when we, when we go to passages um, like uh, Psalm 69, um, 
May my enemies be blotted out of the book of life and not be listed with the righteous. Passages like that. Remember, we're reading psalmody. We're reading poetry. We're reading expressions um, that need to be taken in its poetic context. Um, so, may my enemies be blotted out of the book of life and not be listed with the righteous. Well, well, this is a righteous prayer that has a very sanctified understanding of those who are friends of God and enemies of God. It's, it's not actually saying, it's not a, let's just put it this way. It is not a text about election. Let's put it that way. It's not a text about election. It's a text about the realities that there are those who are friends of God and there are those who are enemies of God and those who are enemies of God are not listed with the righteous. And may it be so, for God is just. Yep, Sam? Is, it, is there a possibility that between the two, the different passages you mentioned, those old covenant passages are also had to do with of, their covenantal context yeah, as well rather yeah. than in the new covenant we have the, the Lamb's Book of Life which is referring to something in particular. Yes. You certainly have that overarching concept in the Old Covenant, that you can be unlisted from the membership role of the nation of Israel. You can, you can be removed, disinherited, and whatnot, which is, which is not true from the, from the perspective of the, the New Covenant in its substance and reality, um, which is comprised of only those who are drawn to the Lord, right? Um, so yeah, again, one of the explicit passages where the language is used is Revelation 3, 5, where it's actually a word of assurance. I will never blot his name out of the book of life. So even if we just take this text exegetically, watch this. It says, the one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments. Who is that? All who are in Christ Jesus are more than conquerors. Book of Romans says so. All who are in Christ Jesus are clothed in his white garments. And if that is true... I will never blot his name out of the book of life. Connect the dots. All who are in Christ Jesus shall never be blotted out of the book of life. For they are conquerors and they are clothed in his righteousness. Problem solved. So, yeah. All right. Let's close in prayer. Gracious God in heaven, we thank you for our study uh, about your decree. And we thank you that you have indeed decreed everything which comes to pass, including this very moment, but especially your decree to give life to a people you have chosen in Christ. And we thank you that we are beneficiaries of your good and wonderful secret counsel, that those of us, of us who have turned to the Lord only have done so by your sheer grace and your decision to, to, to pick us out from eternity past. So we thank you for this undeserved grace, this unmerited favor that you have bestowed upon us. And again, we ask, Lord, that as we continue thinking about your absolute sovereignty, it would not be a matter of controversy, but a matter of comfort, a matter of, uh, of being able to rest in your sovereign hand, and ultimately a matter of worship. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.